and welcome to the Mill Valley Film Festival's education screening of The Falconer. We really hope that you uh, enjoyed this documentary or you're about to enjoy the documentary um, and you're going to enjoy the Q&A that we have for you now with Annie Kempfer, the director of The Falconer. Thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. I, there's a, a lot to talk about. Before we go into the content of the film, I would like to just get to know you as a filmmaker. Can you give students and families a little bit of an idea of um, where your love for film and documentary specifically uh, came from? Sure. Um, I started out in film working at the Environmental Film Festival in the nation's capital. And I was there for a number of years um, programming films for students and for the general public. And after watching just so many fantastic films, I decided that I wanted to make films myself. Um, I went to NYU to study film. And now um, this film, The Falconer, is my first feature length uh, documentary. Thank you for sharing, um, Annie. Uh, so before, this is your first feature film, is that correct? Yes, okay. that's right. So before this, had you directed or produced any short films? Uh, yes, I made some short films, um, documentaries and narratives, and worked on, in other roles, um, some narrative and documentary shorts as well. So can you share with students, and especially if we will have a lot of aspiring filmmakers watching right now, when you're working on documentaries, is there a specific difference, uh, aside from you know length and maybe intensity, of course, between uh, working on a short documentary or a feature? What are some things that they might want to think about if they're deciding what they would like to do? Um, I would say, see where the story takes you. Um, sometimes, it might turn out that a 10 or 15 minute film can capture the whole story that you want to tell. And sometimes things get a little bit more complicated. In this situation, I actually intended to make a short. Um, and I did show a, about a 10 minute cut at a number of film festivals a few years ago, including uh, the California Youth Environment Forum. Um, but it, basically it was a situation where the story that I expected to unfold in a sort of straightforward fashion didn't happen. And, and I became interested in a number of different elements of Rodney's life and his work and his family. And I really wanted to have the time to explore all of those in a feature length. Um, that really brings us to m my next question here um, and kind of talking about Rodney's uh, story. I love in your director statement, you write, in The Falconer, I strive to honor Rodney's life story in all its complexity to show his full self and bring the viewer into his world. I give equal weight to Rodney's public persona and his private moments and take care not to elevate achievements over their context. Um, there's a lot going on in this film. We get to talk about gentrification. We talk about restorative justice. We go a little bit into uh, mental health and of course racism. Um, and also we just talk about the strength of um, that, there's youth empowerment uh, through the environment, through them learning about the environment. Um, I would like to know when you went to tell this story, did you have, um, one specific story that you wanted to tell and then it came, everything that is featured in the documentary just came to life through getting to know Rodney or was it, was it a more comprehensive start? Um, I would say originally I set out to tell the story of Rodney building the bird sanctuary at Oak Hill. So um, at the time, a big grant was expected any day, and they thought the building of the sanctuary would really take place over the course of six months, and it would be done with the cadets from the National Guard Academy down the street. Um, so I was really excited about the possibility to tell this story of Rodney working with a group of kids over the course of six months and in the process building a place where 
um, you know, the kids would have a place to go, their families, they could come back. The birds uh, who Rodney was rescuing would have a place to be. Um, but of course that sort of didn't happen. The money never came in. And over time I kept filming Rodney because he kept doing other interesting things. Um, the progress that he made building the sanctuary was really with the help of his friends and family and with the cadets as well. But I just, uh, I really ended up liking the fact that it was his community that allowed him to build this great sanctuary um, as opposed to just, you know, a grant coming in from the outside. And so basically it started out with a story arc idea of just his work. But after I got to know him over years of filming and hundreds of hours, you know, um, I ended up really wanting to include all the different aspects of his life, um, his poetry, all the music in the film, um, as much as possible is music that Rodney would listen to himself, sort of his playlist. Um, there were some songs we couldn't get the rights to, but as much as possible, we chose all music that he brought uh, to the table. And so, you know, I think there are a lot of films that just hold someone up for their work, but then don't really get into who that person is as a human mm -hmm. being. And I was really trying to have a more wide ranging view. Um, what comes to mind and what I think I would also like for students to think about is when you're telling somebody's story and you're getting to know them, you're spending not hours and in your case years getting to know someone um, intimately, uh, how are you able to form a bond and a connection with the subject while still remaining objective and telling, telling an objective story? I think it's really hard, you know, it's, um, you can't make a film about someone for so long without really caring about them. And I think you do have to pay attention while you're editing, especially, um, how is this story coming across? Um, are you keeping things out because you're afraid the audience might not like your character? Or are you putting things in because you're trying to make people see your character in a certain way, and is that appropriate? Um, I think we all have, we just can't help but have, uh, be aware of those kind of biases, and you just have to get some input from external sources. Um, other people, you know, I was lucky enough to work with a great producer and two great editors, and we also showed the film to a variety of other people for feedback along the way. And, you know, you don't have to take everybody's advice or, or even agree with everyone's opinion, but it's good to sort of have those, have that feedback there to, to hold yourself in check. Is there uh, an update? Students always love to know where the sub, uh, film subjects, um, what they've been up to, since you stopped filming. How is Rodney doing? What's going on? So I actually talked to him earlier today. He's doing well. Um, he bought a house out in Virginia and he is hoping to make a new bird sanctuary there at his house. Um, you know, from the film, you could see that he lived at Oak Hill in this trailer, which where he still is a lot of the time, but it's not a very comfortable living situation. You know, there's no heat in the wintertime and mm -hmm. things like that. So although there's a lot of beautiful land, um, he's hoping to sort of recreate that sanctuary experience at his new home in Virginia. So that's his new plan for the upcoming year. Uh, I know that this film is part of our um, Active Cinema series and uh, Maribel is going to do uh, a Q&A with you where you're also going to talk about steps that uh, our regular audience can take, our Mill Valley Film Fest Festival audience can take um, uh, around this story. But I have a question. What can students do? What can students who are young, uh, under 18, what can they do to either help Rodney or maybe look at environmental issues in, in their area when it comes to uh, bird preservation? Well, um, Rodney has a website, um, which I should have 
written down, um, but I will look up after this and maybe you can share it with the students. Um, so you can always check his website uh, and see how to help Rodney's Rat Pairs, his organization. They definitely were hit pretty hard with COVID because mm -hmm. a lot of his income normally comes from working with people doing um, raptor education for schools or even birthday parties and things like that. Um, so he appreciates any kind of uh, support. I would also suggest looking at the website for the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have some great citizen science activities and students could get involved with um, bird watching and recording uh, useful information in their own areas because you know the type of birds and the birds which are either endangered or at risk really changes from where you are in the United States or or around the world so um, having people in different areas able to provide feedback to scientists can be really helpful. Great do you um, I think it's always nice for students to uh, especially students who get very wrapped up in uh, certain films, and I'm sure there's going to be students who are really going to love your documentary. Can you share with them what your inspirations were when you started out as a documentary filmmaker? Are there any films that you can recommend or that you've seen that you're like, these are, are, are pieces of art I really look up to and, and I'm inspired by? Oh, goodness. Um... Sorry to catch you on the spot. <laughs> oh, there's so many. Um, I would really suggest watching um, POV, which is a PBS program that's on Monday nights at 10 o'clock. It's kind of late, obviously, but you could record it. They have um, fantastic films each season, about 10 to 15 films. Um, I would say, uh, you know, I, I really started with the environmental films mm -hmm. um, myself, but um, there are just so many on a variety of subjects. I most recently just watched um, a three-part series on General Grant, and I thought that was super interesting. Um, I wish I could give you a better answer. I certainly would have prepared yeah no no worries that's that's totally fine um annie uh, you're a well-decorated filmmaker this is your first feature uh but you went uh, to nyu's tisch school of the arts uh, for graduate school you were awarded an alan landsberg documentary award and were a part of the spike lee fellowship what advice can you give to uh, young aspiring filmmakers who may not have the resources uh the funds to uh, create a full-length documentary, a feature, uh, but if they're looking for ways to, uh, to get to that place, how did you apply for any of these awards or programs? What advice can you, can you give students when they're in their search for resources? Uh, well, I would say just keep applying. You know, I think for every um, award or piece of funding or something that you receive, at least I was probably rejected from 20 things for each thing that I did receive. And, you know, just because you don't receive one one year doesn't mean you shouldn't apply again the next year. Um, it's, you know, the way I made the Falconer really was, um, I ended up not really spending any money at all during production. Um, I just borrowed cameras. Obviously, I was lucky enough to be in a film school where I could borrow cameras from the school, but um, a lot of places will lend cameras to students if you do some research into that. Um, you can get friends to help you. I really didn't have a paid crew at all. Um, basically, the cost of the film came in post-production, and um, you know, if I would say if you don't have the funds, um, try making a short first because usually you can use a short, you can show that to people, um, cut together five minutes of footage, and then you can use that to raise money for the larger film. A lot of times, even if people see a one or two minute trailer and you have a nice little sort of pitch book to go with it with your story that you're trying to tell and some information and some visual elements, photos and things, 
that can really um, get people interested. And, um, you know, a lot of funds that came from, uh, came in for the Falconer were from crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. um, you can also get a fiscal sponsor so that if people want to donate money, it can be tax deductible. That's a big help. Um, the fiscal sponsor that we used for the Falconer is from the Heart Productions uh, in California, actually. And um, that just enables people to send in donations that are tax deductible, which is sort of a win-win on both sides. But um, I would say don't wait for the funding because it's really hard to get funding for something that you don't have yet. So, you know, you go use your phone, do some filming and cut it together as best you can and, and try to use that couple minutes to get people interested. That's really great advice, Annie. Thank you so much. I think that will be really helpful uh, for students who might have uh, a vision or know that they have a story to tell, but you know, might not really have an idea of, of where to start. Um, I usually ask filmmakers this question um, and, and one of the pieces of advice is, is also always to just like ask, ask for help. Don't be afraid to just like to just ask. Um, I don't know if that's if that's something that um, well, you clearly had had to do some of that when asking for your friends to help you uh, to help you film. Is that is that something that um, you can encourage students to do? Definitely. And, you know, you can sort of barter also. It's like if, if you come spend a weekend recording sound for me, I'll spend a weekend doing something for one of your projects, um, things like that. I think it's, you know, there are a lot of ways to kind of get it done, but it is true that you just need to ask. And some people might say no, but some people will say yes and even, you know, put what you're trying to get out there out to their own networks too. So I think um, information sharing is really key and it is something that I've found with film that a lot of people really guard uh, their knowledge and their information. You know, people don't want to share budgets and um, things like that, but as far as you can sort of be open with each other. Um, I think that's, it's really helpful for the whole industry. And if you, you can find some people who are willing to, to do that. And certainly, um, you know, if there are any students out there who are needing some help getting started, um, I'd be more than happy to be contacted um, and try and uh, give advice if I could. There you have it, guys. Don't be afraid to ask and don't be afraid to, to email Annie if you have any questions about your work. Um, Annie, I loved your documentary. It was really poignant. It, it brought up a lot of really important issues. And, you know, I really loved um, just I, I got the idea uh, that you really have great care for community. Um, and I think that's just uh, really important uh, for students to, to to highlight and understand as they're learning about art. Without without community, we we can't get anywhere. Um, we appreciate your time. Any any last tips for us? Any last words? I would just say thank you so much, and um, it's so great to be part of Mill Valley. And um, I hope that some of the students out there will be having their own films in the Mill Valley Film Festival next year, and I'll get to see those. Definitely. Thank you so much. And thank you all for joining us. I had a great time uh, doing this Q&A with Annie for you. Check out the rest of the Mill Valley Film Festival education catalog, as well as the uh, standard program and our drive-in this year, if you are local to uh, the Bay Area. We'll see you soon.